Today in the United States, nearly two-thirds of the population is overweight. Almost one in three Americans is obese. And no one wants to be. Americans want to be thinner, and yet old and young Americans are getting fatter and fatter and fatter. We all think it's our own fault. It is not that simple. The food industry is also at fault. We're besieged. Wherever we go, we're encouraged to eat junk food. And the government is at fault. We have government policies that promote overeating from the beginning to the end of the food chain. Tonight, we will tell you how the government and the food industry have helped to make America fat. Now, we know that blaming the government because so many people are overweight, way overweight in many cases, will be rejected by those who say that personal health and well-being are a matter of personal responsibility. We were inclined to that point of view. But this project has proved to us that the processed food industry and the government know full well what is happening, and they are making a bad situation worse. This is Primetime Monday. Tonight, Peter Jennings reporting how to get fat without really trying. We'll return after these messages. We went first to the farmlands of America where the food chain begins. During the harvest season here, fertile soil and hard work pay off with an agricultural abundance that feeds the nation and the world. And here in Millersport, Ohio, people celebrate the harvest in a traditional way. The Millersport Sweet Corn Festival attracts 50,000 people to the music, the pageants, and of course, the corn. This is a celebration of American agriculture. We as Americans spend less of our disposable income on food than anybody else on the face of this globe. Uh, and it's because our farmers are very efficient. They've worked with their government uh, to be able to not only be efficient and effective in what they do, but also produce an incredible product. It's the first time in mankind's history that you haven't have to worry about food. We're the envy of the world in our agricultural system. But the story of American agriculture is also one of unintended consequences. Today, American farmers produce for domestic consumption vastly more food than America needs, nearly twice as much. And the more food we grow, the more we eat. Abundance has become the enemy. When I first started studying nutrition, it never occurred to me that I didn't need to know anything at all about agriculture. Now I see it as the basis of everything having to do with nutrition. If you want to understand why people eat the way they do, you need to understand the way agriculture works in this country. To begin with, agriculture works in America through farm subsidies. During the Depression in the 1930s, government began subsidizing farmers to save them from financial ruin. The money never stopped. This year, government will put roughly $20 billion into agriculture, most of it directly to the farmers. And not many people in the government have made the connection between subsidies to agriculture and obesity. But there is one, and it's very important. Does the government take dietary guidelines and nutritional concerns into consideration when it's making those grants? There's no concern whatsoever. There's no link between agricultural subsidies and health. In fact, we've been trying to find analyses of what is the health impact of the farm subsidies. We can't find a single study. Congress, the administration, is handing out these subsidies without knowing what is the ultimate impact on their constituents, the American public. The Bush administration's man in charge of public health is Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson. Do you see any connection between the federal government's agricultural subsidy programs and nutrition? I, I really don't. Because the subsidy programs are, are things that are done through Congress, uh, much more so than 
uh, than uh, trying to come up with an overall strategy as, as far as nutrition is concerned. Well, do you see a connection between the money which government gives to agriculture right. and nutrition? Do you see a connection? There's no question that if you uh, have money out there and subsidize in particular things, it's, that product is going to be grown more. And some of those products are not good for nutrition. If that's what you're asking me, yes. This is the food pyramid, the government's guide to good nutrition, what we should be eating. Less of what is on top, sugars, fats, and then meats and dairy, and more of what's on the bottom, grains and fresh fruits and vegetables. Of the total amount of money that supports American agriculture, how much of that money goes towards fruits and vegetables, both production and promotion? You'd have to look at the percentage uh, as less than 1%. Really? Uh, minimal, minimal products. We wanted to see what the food pyramid would look like if it reflected where the government farm subsidies actually end up. Look at this. Since 1995, meat and dairy got about three times the subsidies of grains. According to data from the Department of Agriculture and the Environmental Working Group, fats and oils, the foods government says we should eat least, got about 20 times more subsidies than fruits and vegetables. There's a disconnect between agricultural policy and health policy. That's probably the biggest problem that the federal government faces. We don't look at how agricultural policy can help improve public health. It's strictly about subsidies. And does government know this? Government knows it. I'm not sure government at the moment knows what to do about it. How do you undo government policy that has not been focused on health and nutrition, but has been focused on subsidizing farmers? The most heavily subsidized crop in America is corn. Farmers plant nearly 80 million acres of corn, and in the last five years, they got an average of five and a half billion dollars in federal subsidies every year. On your mark. Get set eat! When most of us think of corn, we do tend to think of the sweet corn they're eating here at the Millersport Festival. It don't get any better than this, folks. Lost it too. Lost it too. Oh, no. Lost it too. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. But there is another way to think of corn, not as corn on the cob, but as cheap, raw material for the giant food industry. The vast majority of corn is feed corn. It's fed to chickens, hogs, and especially cattle. That corn helps these animals grow faster, fatter, and holds down the costs of meat. That encourages Americans to eat more meat. Of course, beef cattle were never intended to eat corn, and so they have to be given all sorts of antibiotics to keep them healthy. Subsidized corn is everywhere. The whole food system has been, as someone said, cornified. Corn is processed and put into thousands of products that Americans use every day. There you go, enjoy the show. If you want to see more directly how farm subsidies can lead to obesity, there is no better place than your local theater. The popcorn you eat here is made with subsidized corn. One large popcorn? Sure, no problem. The popcorn is so inexpensive that the bag it comes in costs more than the popcorn. That's why you can buy the mega size for just a few pennies more. The oil they cook it in is subsidized too. And so is the oil they put on top. That is not usually butter, but subsidized vegetable oil. And there's corn in the soda a corn-derived sweetener called high-fructose corn syrup. Since the 1970s, its use has gone up more than 4,000%. Subsidized corn sweeteners, which have pretty much taken over from sugar, are in candy and pretzels and some hot dogs, too. Is there something else I can get you tonight, like uh, a hot dog or a nice warm pretzel? Here's something else to know about obesity. Americans consume nearly three times more corn in the form of corn sweeteners than they do in every other form. Corn is the principal source of sweeteners in American diets. So what these subsidies do is to lower the cost of the ingredients that go in processed foods, particularly high-calorie processed foods, and they make those foods cheaper. Currently, the government subsidizes corn, corn, yeah. corn, and more corn, and very little 
fresh fruits and vegetables. But corn is a, a stable that is not only used for, for food, it's also used uh, for the tremendous animal industry that we have in this country. So it's important uh, that corn continues to grow in America. Do you believe we should plant less corn and more fruits and vegetables? Well, that you can't make that... Uh, that determination from Washington, D.C. The government already controls the way food is grown, processed, and consumed in this country. There are already government policies that are involved in every aspect of the food chain, from production to consumption. We want the government to be involved in personal eating behavior in a more healthful way. Here's another example of a massive government subsidy which contributes to obesity, soybeans. Most of the soy that people eat is not in its healthy form, such as soy protein, but in the form of oil, including cooking oil and margarine. Soybean oil is the largest source of added fats in the American diet. As for fruits and vegetables, if Americans were to follow a healthy diet, the Department of Agriculture says that nearly twice the number of acres of fruits and vegetables would have to be planted. Why do you think fruits and vegetables do get so little support from the federal government? Oh, I guess um, uh, you could say our, our lobbyists aren't as good. Uh, maybe we haven't had the tradition. Do you mean that? Uh, other aspects, other divisions of the food industry are better lobbyists than you? We've not had traditional subsidy programs, so there's not an ingrained group in Congress that's there fighting for the program, fighting for the fruit and vegetable program. We're talking about huge agribusiness companies uh, that own thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres. And these are, of course, the people who give the largest campaign contributions to members of Congress. It does make you think twice about all the symbols of agricultural abundance that we see in the nation's capital. A reminder of how important subsidies are in the political system and how hard it will be to change that whatever the impact on the nation's health. Do you hold the Congress accountable for subsidizing the wrong foods? No, I do not. I think that is a decision that Congress makes, and I'm not going to criticize Congress on the decisions they make as far as food products. Why do you think no one in government has made the connection between agricultural policy and obesity? I don't think, I really don't think it's uh, as, uh, as you have stated it, Peter. I don't think that there's any direct correlation out there that agriculture policy has been set up uh, in some insidious way to subsidize things that are going to be bad for our health. I didn't suggest it was insidious. I'm suggesting that there is a possibility that government subsidizes more food, which you would say, as the country's leading health officer, is bad for us, and subsidizes less those foods, which you would tell us are good for us and we should eat. And that has also been throughout the ages. And uh, Congress has made those decisions, and they're political ones, as you know, Peter. And I don't think you're going to change the political arena as far as subsidizing agriculture in America in the near future. Well, the Secretary is probably right. But with so many voters in the country desperately trying to lose weight, you might think some clever politician would devise an I'll make you thinner platform it would at least question for the first time how federal agriculture policy helps to make us fat. We'll be back in just a minute. Americans probably don't think very much about government food policies when they're in the supermarket, but maybe they should. The cheapness of the food ingredients encourages the food industry to produce processed foods that sit on supermarket shelves, have very cheap ingredients, and can be sold at high prices because they're branded. Processed foods are typically made from a mixture of sugar, water, flour, starch, fat, artificial colorings and flavorings. And you could make almost anything out of that. Puddings, snack foods, beverages, those are dirt cheap to produce. The food is nothing. It's the processing. That's where the profits are. A typical supermarket may have 30, 40, 50,000 products, most of it processed food made with government subsidized ingredients. In 2002, supermarkets sold $174 billion worth of processed food. Food industries pushed on mass distribution of low cost products. That's their strategy. 
Jim Tillotson is a professor, but in the 1970s, he worked for the Ocean Spray Company. For years, my favorite drink was orange juice, but cranberry juice cocktail is a smashing new taste. Tillotson figured out how to make more money by replacing expensive ingredients in Ocean Spray products, like real fruit juice, without people noticing. You could make a drink that was very good, probably more inexpensively, by using some fruit juice, sugar and water, and a very fine flavor system, and people couldn't tell the difference. Since sugar was expensive, Tillotson turned to that inexpensive, subsidized corn sweetener, high fructose corn syrup. So we were able to reduce the price and be profitable. And as a matter of fact, at the time I brought my wife a Volvo, and I, we always refer to it as a sugar wagon, because my bonus came from being able to save the company a lot of money using high fructose corn syrup. People ask me, well, weren't you concerned about eventually that people would get fat from this? It never crossed our mind. Absolutely never crossed our mind. With obesity on our minds, we went to the Food Marketing Institute's annual convention in Chicago. This is where the packaged food industry unveils its new products. It's Chuck Normus. It is Chuck Normus. All those subsidized farm ingredients are being turned into products like these. There's a half a pound of meat in each jar. Microwaves in six minutes. These are interactive beverages. It actually is a product designed to emulate chewing tobacco. It's a Latino-inspired beverage. We couldn't quite believe what we were seeing here. Thousands of new products. What I like to say is you who is like an everyday sort of thing, three or four times a day, whereas your Yoohoo Double Fudge is more like a dessert. Free samples, we're giving them away today. And while a lot of the products looked familiar to us, everyone was telling us that they had the newest thing. We have over 100 new products. It's Sprite with a little tropical flavor, and for us, that little sense of newness. When you look at all the products introduced by the industry in recent years, one thing is absolutely clear. The vast majority are foods that Americans should be eating less meal dessert so it's like your post you who you who if you look at the new foods that are being marketed each year probably 90 percent of them are packaged foods very often junk foods the tip of that food pyramid what you should eat less of last year there were more than 2800 new candies desserts ice creams and snacks and 230 new fruit or vegetable products when we were looking at the mix of products your industry has introduced in the past 10 or 15 years, it looks like you are giving people a greater choice of food which government mostly thinks are unhealthy for them and less choice of those which are healthy for them. I think that the food industry is providing a, a wide variety of choice. And certainly if you look at some of the recent market trends, uh, you're seeing a, a major increase in the good for you foods category. Well, here's what we found. Of all the products introduced last year, thousands of them, only 131 of them even claim to be reduced or low in calories. And the more of these top of the pyramid, low nutrition, high calorie foods they introduce, the more of them we eat. In the 60s and 70s, we consumed healthy snacks. Kids consume milk, we consume fruit, we consume what you would think of as really good foods. What's changed in the last decade is we're consuming high fat, salty snacks. That could be tortilla chips or potato chips. It could be kind of candies and desserts and so forth. We've really changed the nature of what we call a snack. You can go into any grocery store and into any restaurant. You can buy the, uh, the diet soda if you want to. You can buy the low fat alternatives. You can buy the smaller portion if you want to. Rick Berman runs the Center for Consumer Freedom, funded by the restaurant industry. Just look what this reckless cookie-baking business has done to my client. They have been running advertisements criticizing those who criticize the food industry. You make them taste good on purpose, don't you? I guess so. Learn more about lawyers cashing in on obesity. What the food companies are doing is just responding to consumer demand. Is it, as far as you're concerned, entirely a matter of personal choice and not at all a matter of marketing? Well, ultimately, it is a matter of personal choice. I mean, we can't dictate what people choose to eat. So yes, at some point, what people choose to eat or how they choose to move is, is ultimately the issue here. Of course what you eat is a personal decision. The overweight and obesity epidemics are a result of people choosing to eat more, eat larger portions, and eat more often. Americans are choosing foods with more sweeteners and more calories. 
they're drinking more sodas, eating more candy, and snacking all day long. Don't you think the food industry is simply giving people the products they want? I don't think that you can talk about giving the public what the public wants without discussing the $33 billion a year that the food industry spends to try to promote that kind of want. Do we need anything else here? If you were going to design a strategy to try to get people to eat more food, you'd make food more convenient, you'd make it ubiquitous, you'd encourage people to eat more frequently on more different eating occasions, and you'd encourage them to eat larger portions. And all of those are deliberate strategies to sell more food. In the last 20 years, you have increased the size of your products. You have increased the number of products you introduce. You have increased the marketing of your products. Are these not strategies designed to get people to eat more? No, they're strategies to respond to what people's needs are today. I think that the industry is acting very responsibly to try to bring these products to market in a responsible way and to make sure that what they're offering um, fits into people's healthy diets. Working the pounds off, it's Good Morning America's Lock the Door, Lose the Weight. Americans weight talk a lot about being fit and thinner. Americans spend billions of dollars every year on diets and exercise. Reach and pull good. There are thousands of exercise videos, machines, gadgets, gimmicks, all designed to help us lose the weight we put on by eating too much. Uh -huh. How about butt squeeze? Uh -huh. ah! Oh! And for the food industry, exercise is a convenient answer to obesity. I think people do need to exercise more. Uh, and not just exercise, because uh, when you think of exercise, it often seems like it's, it's more than you can fit into your very busy day. Uh, but you can take small steps. Obesity is not going to be solved th through sheer physical activity. The food industry would like to blame everything on lack of exercise. Eat as much as you want, exercise it off. Go out and buy a bike or play basketball with your kid. We should do that, but that's only part of the battle. And here is why. You have to jog for 15 minutes to burn just one ounce of potato chips. You have to bike for an hour to burn the calories in this soda. And this supersized meal at McDonald's has so many calories, you have to walk for six hours to burn it off. It is hard to see how exercise alone is the solution to obesity and one food company appears to get it. We need to be part of the solution. We need to try to make a difference here. If you need to be part of the solution, does this mean you're part of the problem? I think uh, food is part of the problem. Michael Mudd is a senior vice president at Kraft, the largest American food processor. They make Triscuits and Oreos and Oscar Mayer products, among other things. What do you think the right public policy is? Do you think it has as its bottom line, eat less? If you ask the question, should America be eating less, definitely we should be eating less, especially if we're not going to increase our activity. We would not support uh, a move to eat less because that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, simply suggesting to people that you, you eat less food uh, really is, I think, uh, it's not the approach to take. Given what you do for a living, isn't that rather self-serving? Well, our message is eat a balanced diet, eat foods that are at the top of the pyramid in moderation, and get some activity in your life. Kraft's approach is different. The company has proposed a wholesale review of all their products and their marketing because they know obesity is an epidemic. What we'll do is go uh, category by category, product by product, to look for small but meaningful uh, opportunities to improve the nutrition. What's the definition of meaningful? Let's say I have a reduced fat product that takes out five grams versus the original and 10 people choose that product. So on a population-wide basis, we've saved 50 grams of fat. But if I take uh, a, the regular version of that product and I remove one gram of fat, and I do it in a way that doesn't affect the taste, and now 90 people choose that product, on a population-wide basis, I've saved 90 grams of fat. And that's my definition of a meaningful change. In other words, making every product a little healthier would have an effect on more people. And then we also have roasted garlic. Public health experts say that it could help if Kraft follows through. Pick up your chips over at Unilever Ice Cream, Unilever Best Food, and... But counting on voluntary measures by the food industry to improve the American diet is something of a gamble. 
Let's find ourselves a winner. After all, their job is to sell more food, and it is hard to imagine the companies sacrificing their profits for the benefits of public health. If you're lucky, yeah, are you feeling lucky? <laughs> what the food companies are worried about now is that there will be a public backlash against their products. And so they're all scrambling to try to figure out what to do. If the public starts eating less, that's going to be bad for business, and there's no getting around that. Eat less means that we're not going to buy as much product. It goes all the way down the chain, the supermarkets, the restaurants, the food manufacturers, agriculture. We're not going to need as much product. And that's going to be a very difficult lesson to get through. We have said from the outset that the processed food industry is very smart and will adapt as it sees fit when there is public pressure. Look at all the low-fat products they've introduced. Trouble is, when the companies take out the fat, they often put in more sweeteners, which means more calories. So since all those products with reduced fat came on the market, Americans have actually put on more weight. How to get fat without really trying will continue in a moment. How to get fat without really trying continues. Selling food is a huge business. It's, it's wonderful. And behind every ad campaign is a food stylist. We use margarine most of the time because of the color. These are the people who make food look irresistible in the advertising. So these drinks look better than real life. At the Food Stylist Convention in Minneapolis, we learned what it takes to make cereal look perfect. Do you want to come over some of the flakes? That's hair tonic they're using instead of milk, which might wilt the cereal. My recipe for fake ice cream. This isn't ice cream, it's Crisco shortening. And they can light it, they can try big scoops, little scoops. We can play around with this all day long. Food styling makes all the ads look great, and they can be very seductive. So rich, so creamy. The food industry spends $34 billion a year to market their products. One strawberry blasted honeycomb! And these particular ads, who do you think they are designed for? I'm so hungry. What's hell? My Pringles, no way. It is estimated that the food industry spent more than $12 billion last year promoting food they want children to eat. It is twice what they spent 10 years ago. Kids are a very dynamic audience. Paul Kernett is an advertising executive who specializes in marketing to children. Why is so much time and money spent advertising to children? Kids are in many ways unsocialized. They are uh, fresh-eyed. They are open to new ideas. Kids are big business. There's no question about that. Most of the food that is advertised to children is processed food, and it is exactly what children are buying. Oh, yummy! Children spend more of their own money on food than anything else, more than on CDs or movies or clothes or toys. And the public health implications of children's diets are enormous. The problem is, is that most of the foods that are marketed to children are unhealthy foods. And the children are exposed to so many messages about junk food that the cultural norm around food has changed so that children think that they should be getting candy and cookies and chips and soda and these other junky foods all the time. The average American child sees 10,000 food advertisements a year on television alone. Most of those advertisements are for fast food, sugar-coated cereals, soft drinks and candy, and other foods dense in fat and calories. These are your members. Are you happy to hear those statistics? Well, I think that companies are, are trying to market their products responsibly. And if you look at some of the categories that are there, it's not, it's not all those foods that are available all the time and advertised on television. But they're I think not advertising a, fruits and vegetables on television. Well, they're advertising other options for cereal on television and, and other really snack sweetened. products as well. They're baby food desserts. Maybe that's where it starts. And then when kids are two years old, they gain the strength to turn on the television set and they see the, the constant stream of commercials. Then they go to school. And even in schools, there are encouragements to eat junk food. 
When you are putting together an advertising campaign, do you care whether the product is healthy or not? I care that the product has a positive role in a child's life. It is not my fundamental responsibility to be sure that that product in and of itself fulfills a complete diet. Have you played a role in making less healthy products appealing to children, thereby increasing their desire for those products? I've played a role in making all kinds of products appealing to kids. And the, the issue of less healthy is a judgment call that you can make. But you know what's less healthy. You know where asparagus and soda pop line up. You are absolutely correct that I am not going to get the same return on investment for a client in advertising asparagus and spinach to a kid as advertising some of the so-called less healthy products to kids. Guilty as charged. Don't you know nothing? Have you noticed how most food is marketed to kids, directly to kids? For dabble your applesauce and turn it green. They put cartoon characters all over the package, including characters from Disney, the parent company of ABC News. Candy for breakfast? They turn candy into breakfast cereal. Ooh, snackometry time. They encourage kids to eat junk food in school. And they tell kids they can win money if they buy certain foods. Find the one Oreo that turns your milk blue, and you could win a million bucks. They probably won't get a lot of money. But if children eat them, they will get a lot of calories. And if you are the parent of a small child, we can almost guarantee that they're asking you to buy some of this. That's what the industry wants kids to do. Parents that I talk to who have young children tell me that the last thing in the world they want to argue with their kids about is food. And the marketers know that. And so they deliberately target the advertising to generate what they call a nag factor. My kids, for example, pestered me endlessly to buy Lucky Charms cereal, which was the one that we had the most fights over when they were young. Um, and every now and then I'd let them get it. It was too much trouble arguing with them. And here is something ironic. The people who make the ads often blame parents for not protecting children from the effects of the advertising that they've created. More often than not, children who nag their parents to buy them uh, any kind of product are children and parents in whom the relationship is fundamentally flawed. Sounds a little bit like you're criticizing the parents for not doing a good enough job. I am. I think that there is a parental abdication of responsibility and limits in terms of what is appropriate for their kids. If companies think that parents should be making decisions about their children's food, then they should market child-oriented food products to parents. But they don't. They're bypassing the parents, and they're talking directly to our kids and trying to get our kids to nag us to buy their unhealthy products. Snack! Children's diets are clearly influenced by all this advertising. Let's eat! There is so much research to show that what you show children on TV affects their intake, uh, and the amount of, of children's TV that's dominated by food and the total amount of our TV budget that's dominated by food commercials is enormous. All the marketing to children is feeding an epidemic of childhood obesity. 15% of all children between 6 and 19 are overweight or obese, and that is nearly 9 million children. Many children already show signs of the serious diseases that result from being overweight. Our children eat so badly nowadays that a quarter of elementary school age children already have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or some other risk factor for heart disease. These are little kids, and they already are on their way to a heart attack. Very young children are now showing signs of type 2 diabetes, a terrible disease that was never seen in such young children before. The diet of many American children may already be condemning them to a lifetime of illness. Why are we allowing companies to market junk foods to young children? It's like having door-to-door -door salespeople knock on the door and say, ma'am, I'd like to talk to your young child alone, if you don't mind, and then encourage the kid to eat junk food. No parent would ever allow that. Is there any way to stop this? 
when we come back. This is where the food industry learns how to sell food to children. Who else likes chips? Who else eats chips as a snack? These okay. children are part of a paid focus group at C&R Research in Chicago. If I eat this, I will feel how, because why? These researchers are trying to learn what makes kids want certain foods. Okay. And did you try the, the colored ketchup? No. You didn't try it? Why not? <laughs> it looked disgusting. <laughs> okay. And on the other side of the one-way mirror, the researchers are gathering data that will help food companies tailor their advertising to children. Children are more susceptible to marketing than adults are because they don't understand the intent of marketing. They don't understand that a marketer may exaggerate claims or isn't completely truthful, or that someone is trying to sell them something. Study after study shows that younger children simply do not understand what advertising is all about, that young children cannot comprehend how advertising is manipulating them. Okay. Same children cannot be expected to exercise critical thinking or personal responsibility at f about food choice until they're quite a bit older. The exact age is a matter of some research debate, but eight-year-olds certainly fall below it. Do you think it is fair or even ethical to advertise to children below seven? I'm not sure what the cut point is, is ethics, but one of the amusing aspects in my current professional life is I get calls from uh, very high-level executives of very, very large food companies asking me questions like, um, what do you suppose the cut point should be to marketing to children? Do you think it's okay to market to 18-year-olds? What about 15-year-olds? What about 12-year-olds? They know they're doing something wrong. They know they are. What do you think is an appropriate age to begin advertising to a child? In our judgment, we think, uh, you know, six is a better place to draw the line. We think kids are a little bit more mature then. They're in school, they're out in the world, they're beginning to experience things beyond the home, and they have a little bit more judgment. Do you foresee a possibility in the future that you might not advertise to children who are under eight or 10? You know, this is a topic that society is gonna continue to debate. And, you know, I don't think the last chapter has been written on this book. Kraft cheese and macaroni! Kraft seems to know that they're under some pressure. They say they won't intentionally design ads for children under six, and they have recently stopped advertising in schools. Other than that, in America, kids are fair game. Honey, sweet, crunchy crave. But not everywhere else. Italy prohibits all ads on cartoon shows. Australia doesn't allow advertising during television programs for preschoolers. Norway and Sweden prohibit all television advertising to children under 12. In the U.S., there are no laws whatsoever prohibiting the food companies from advertising any food to children of any age. The companies and the advertisers like it this way. Has it ever occurred to you that children should be protected by the government from certain food advertising? It has occurred to me, and it, I think it would be a very dangerous precedent. In a free society, in a commercial society, where we advertise legal products to various consumers, advertising legal products to kids in a responsible and ethical way should definitely be permitted. Of course, you cannot advertise cigarettes on television anymore. The government does try to protect children from cigarettes. And some years ago, one government agency did try to protect children from food advertising. In the late 1970s, the Federal Trade Commission began investigating the marketing of unhealthy foods to children. Michael Perchuk was chairman at the time. We certainly made a judgment that advertising to young children was unfair. It, within the meaning of the law, was unfair because children don't have the capacity to deal with it. Breakfast for everyone! The Federal Trade Commission made a couple of stunning proposals. Either ban ads for sugar-coated foods to children under 11, or ban all television advertising to children under eight. I was convinced then, and I'm convinced to this day, that our case was sound on the, on the facts, the impact of advertising on children and the health of, of children, and that it was sound in the law. I think this is absolutely stupid to come in here and ask that we now give to the FTC 
unlimited jurisdiction. What we're trying to do is to say to the FTC, stop it. And if In no work, time, the FTC was under attack. The huge mistake was not to gauge the political impact and especially the power of the food lobby, the broadcasting lobby, and their friends in Congress. It got really ugly. There were even threats to shut down the FTC. We could ensure that not only the staff members no longer there, but the commission members themselves are no longer there. So the FTC had its head handed to it by Congress. And legislators and the Federal Trade Commission remember that. And for the last almost 25 years, there's been essentially no talk about limiting junk food or other advertising aimed at children. 25 years. And since then, according to the Surgeon General, obesity among children and adults has become the most pressing public health issue in the nation. Clearly, when you look at the consequences of the public health crisis we have today, government has got to step in. It's no different than tobacco was 20 or 30 years ago. We told people don't smoke. But until we really started to get serious about it and make changes, look at the escalation of health care costs associated with tobacco smoking. The exact same thing is happening now in terms of food choices. So will government step in? You, in fact, sir, said at one point you would give awards to people who behaved better in the food industry. That is correct. What happens if they don't behave better? Then what are you going to do? Once you start giving out awards for a particular uh, company, particular fast food industry, a uh, recipient or a soft drink, I think the other ones are going to say, you know, I want the award next time and I'm going to do more to get it. I think it's much better to be on the positive side than the negative side. The Bush administration urges Americans to exercise more and eat healthier. But there is no sign that government will obligate the food industry to change how they make and market food and no sign whatsoever that government will try to change agricultural policies so as to benefit the public health. How to get fat without really trying will continue in a moment. We know there is no easy solution to the growing obesity epidemic. Most of us do need to eat better and exercise more and what adults eat is ultimately a personal decision. But there's no reason for government to encourage the production and the consumption of so much food that we should be eating less. And clearly there should be a public debate about advertising junk food to children. That'll be a difficult issue for the food industry and for the television industry, including ABC. As we made this program, we often thought about how long it took before government recognized that smoking was a public health issue. And now it's obesity. Just think of the money it is costing the country. So how long will it take government to act? I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you and good night. To purchase a video cassette or DVD of this program, please visit abcnews.com or call 800-505-6139.